The book of Daniel, Daniel Hanavi, the prophet Daniel. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you uh, for this time that we gather as a family, as a fellowship, as a church, as believers in you, Lord, trusting you, dedicating, uh, Lord, ourselves to you, offering ourselves, our minds to you, Lord, to the study of your word. Help us to see great things, Lord, in your law. And we ask you, Lord, to bless us. Uh, bless us, Lord, because we came. Bless us, Lord, because we're in your presence, hearing from you. We ask you that through your Holy Spirit, you make this, uh, these scriptures real to us, Lord. And what's going on in the world, we pray that it'll be, we'll be able to see it, Lord, through your lenses, through your eyes. And that we would not panic, we would not fear what man can do, Lord, but we would trust in the living God. And we'll trust also in the God of heavens who reveals mysteries. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 1. Daniel is an amazing book, and maybe we'll spend a few weeks on it as, as we uh, teach uh, Bible prophecy or the prophecy updates. It goes line in line with our updates. And the basics of Daniel, to understand Bible prophecy, uh, sometimes people begin in other books. And I think one good book to start on, if you want to learn Bible prophecy, is to start with the book of Daniel. Part of the reason is Daniel explains a lot of the mysteries that are shown to him. He explains them, or an angel explains it to them. Now, there are deep things in Daniel. I'm not saying I know everything about it. There are certain things that were shut off until the end, as he was told. But if you're going to understand Bible prophecy, it's a good place to start. Don't be afraid of Daniel. Daniel is a book that has been harassed by many critics. In fact, it's always been dated by the liberal, uh, liberal Christians as it happened during the time of the Greeks because they cannot imagine that he was so accurate that he was able to predict things not only for the first coming of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus, but also the time between the testaments, um, the intertestamental period. It's just a term that means between Malachi and Matthew. And just like the Gospels, uh, Daniel has a very basic understanding of Bible prophecy. Do you remember the parable of Jesus, his, uh, the parable of the seed and the soil? Remember that, that parable? It's a wonderful parable, um, greatly misunderstood in a lot of circles. And unfortunately, it is misunderstood because it also is the key to all the other parables. Jesus said of that parable, uh, when his disciples asked him, he said, how can you understand all the other parables if you don't understand this one? It's about the parable of the soil and the seed. And uh, if you remember that parable, Jesus told us, we don't have to imagine it. We don't have to guess what these things are. What's the seed? Anybody remember what the seed is? The word of God. All right, not everybody at once, but the word of God. What are, what is the soil? The world? Um, yeah, it's the condition of people's hearts or the condition of where the seed lands, right? The condition of that person's spiritual condition at the time the seed lands. Uh, remember, some of the seeds fell on fallow ground, a very hard ground. Some of it fell on shallow ground. Some of it fell on thorny and rocky ground. And one of them fell on wonderful, fertile ground. The ground was, uh, was ready. Each one of them, with the exception of the first one, had some growth. Uh, the first one didn't have growth, but the, all the other ones had some growth. In fact, the last one had all the fruit. They actually developed a fruit of uh, 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold. And um, what's the, the other character that comes up? And that is the birds. The birds. What's the birds? Satan, right? Now, we didn't have to imagine any of that, right? You got it straight from Scripture. Jesus told us exactly what it is, and so he gave us the understanding of the parables. In fact, he said, if you get that parable, you can understand all the other parables. Because one fascinating thing about Jesus is the fact that he didn't explain all the parables. He explained some of them, but not all of them. Uh, but he gave us the key. The key is if you got the first one, the parable of the kingdom, the parable of the soil and the seed. If you got those, you can understand all the other parables very easily if you just apply them. And so this is the way Daniel is. All the other Old Testament prophets don't explain the prophecies. You ever notice that? Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, they don't spend the time explaining it. They just, it happens, it's done, 
Uh, it's sort of reminiscent of like Jeremiah, you know, the, the, the belt or the book where they burn the scroll. You have to combine with other passages to realize what actually has happened or to know uh, what happened or what, what it means. Daniel is not like that. Daniel tells you. It tells you uh, the, 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 the king has a dream. This guy, where is it? There we go. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and it's a statue, and it's got different, uh, different go- items of gold. The head of gold and silver and the bronze and the, and the iron, and you don't have to guess what it is. It tells you what it is. And then Nebuchadnezzar has another dream, right? And it tells you, Daniel tells him what it is. He's going to be chopped down. And on and on, and then there's the ram, and then there's the goat, and then all these, the beast, and the angel explains it to him. So anyway, long story short, it is, explains prophecy. So when you run into, let's say, the beast of Revelation, you can turn to Daniel, and Daniel explains it to you. Because what it means in Revelation it means exactly that in Daniel. So we know what that means. So before we look at Bible prophecy in terms of current events, let's look at chapter 1, the first three verses of the book of Daniel. If somebody want to, nice and loud, because I know some people want to hear it, but uh, somebody want to nice and loud, verses 1 through 3, chapter 1, 1 through 3. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenza, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. So he was taken to Babylon. This is the first attack on Jerusalem. There were three sieges that Babylon did on Jerusalem. Three of them on the kingdom of Judah. This is the first one. The first one is when he carries off the treasures. And when he carried off the treasure, he actually carried off something else too, or someone else. He carried some of the nobility. He carried off some of the people that were uh, actually part of the nobility, some of the sons of Israel, the royal family. In fact, in verse 4, it says, Youth who have no defect, good-looking, intelligence, every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding, discerning, knowledge, who have the ability for serving in the king's court, And he ordered them to teach them the literature in the language of the Chaldeans. So he took the best, the very best. And no doubt, this is the first attack. Jehoiakim was the king of Judah. Uh, Babylon comes in. Nebuchadnezzar comes in. And he doesn't destroy it. He simply takes the best, the treasures, and puts another king in place, a puppet king, Jehoiakim's brother, puts him in place, and so now he gets to do what Nebuchadnezzar does, uh, wants him to do. So that's the first time they carried off to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, no doubt, when you read this, when you read this, he begins to act in a very interesting way. He begins to act like the spirit of Antichrist. He is an Antichrist. And the spirit of Antichrist is moving in him to do things against the people of God. But he doesn't do it right away, does he? He doesn't come and level the place. He does that the third time, 586 B.C., circa. It's a 586 B.C. He destroys, levels Jerusalem. But first, he carries off some of the most interesting things, treasures, people. And he takes them to, where do they go? He takes them to a place called Babylon. Actually, the Bible calls it Shinar. He calls it Shinar. It is the place where the Tower of Babel was located. The Tower of Babel was located. So if you go back to Genesis chapter 10 and 11, you will find that this is the place where the Tower of Babel was located. Shinar, Babylon. And this is the place, what happened in Babylon? Anybody remember what happened in Babylon? This was the place where? The three wise men, almost there, yeah. The, uh, the Tower of Babel. Yeah. This oh, was the, the, Tower. the Tower of Babel. Yeah, this is the place where the people constructed a huge tower. Uh, it's probably called a ziggurat. Archaeological evidence shows us that, and there's plenty of those around. So um, it's 
you can look it up online, ziggurat. And it's a great, they're magnificent things. And uh, what it was used for was to man to reach God, right? That was it, was, it was a worship place. It was actually a worship center. And it was a place where they could ascend to be to the heavens. They could ascend to the heavens. They wanted to be like God. Now, who has done that before? Satan. Satan. You got to read Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28 tells us Satan wanted to be like God. He wanted to climb up there. He wanted to get up there. And Babylon is serving the exact same place. So in the exact same place that the mankind to try to reach God is the exact same place Nebuchadnezzar takes the people into Babylon, Shinar. So Nebuchadnezzar is acting in a very, very interesting way when you see it. But he chooses the best. So there's an interesting comparison. When we look at the spirit of Antichrist, we look at Antichrist, we look at Jesus, they're quite diametrically opposed, right? Jesus chooses his disciples. Nebuchadnezzar chooses his people to serve him, right? He chooses servants. Jesus picked 12 to serve him. Nebuchadnezzar picked his 12 or his people to serve him, God's people to serve him. And they both go to Israel. They're from Israel. So it's a very, very interesting thing. Now, it says... That in verse 5, the king appointed from a daily ration from the king's choice of food and from, which, and, and from the wine which they drank, verse 5, appointed that they should be educated for three years. three years. How long did the disciples spend with Jesus? Three years. The spirit of Antichrist at work. Jesus trained them for three years. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to train them for three years. So we can compare the two, right? There's a similarity there because we know that Nebuchadnezzar is operating from the spirit of Antichrist, but he doesn't take just anybody. He takes what? Nebuchadnezzar takes the best, the treasures, right? And he put them into the treasure house of Babylon, his God. He took the treasures, but he took more than the treasure, right? He took something that is more important to God, his people. He kept the captivity, takes them into captivity, and... Um, it's interesting, Jesus told a parable about a treasure, didn't he? Anybody remember the parable about the treasure? Yeah. Remember that? What was that one? I know I'm exercising a little bit of the muscles you haven't used in a week or so, but it's okay. Uh, we were here Monday, so we got some spiritual exercises done, right? He says that there's a man who goes into the field and finds a treasure in the field. Now, what does he do? The man sells everything he has, basically gives everything up for the treasure. Now, what is the field? The field is the world. The treasure is the body of believers, right? The body of Christ. Jesus comes to save those who would believe in him. And Jesus gives everything up, his, himself, his life. He gives everything up for the treasures of God are his people. So the difference between Nebuchadnezzar and Jesus, of course, obviously Jesus gives up his life for the treasure that's in the world, that's the people of God. Nebuchadnezzar just takes the treasure, takes the people, and puts them in his own storehouse. And there's a great comparison of the two. We're not going to get into it tonight, maybe another night, of the, the difference. It's storehouses, the, uh, the, the treasure houses of his God versus the treasure houses of God. You know, that's uh, the vessels of God, the vessels of honor that God has versus the vessels of honor that the Nebuchadnezzar had. So Jesus is like the man who sees the treasure, gives up everything, buys a field, takes the treasure for himself, just like Jesus said, he would be the savior of the whole world. He dies for the whole world, and only those who believe in him eventually become his body, his believers become part of the body of Christ. That's the treasure. He gives it all up. But Nebuchadnezzar takes the precious things from the temple, it's like taking the precious people from Jerusalem. So what happened physically, it's a representation of something that's happening spiritually. He takes the treasure, but he takes the people. He takes what is, belongs to God rightfully, and he makes it his. So the world wants, I think I put it there, the world wants the best. The world wants the best. What did he want? He wanted the noble, the smart, the handsome people, the beautiful people. Uh, with understanding, verse 3, knowledge, ability to serve the king's court. Who did Jesus choose? Now, by the way, they go to, uh, Nebuchadnezzar goes to Jerusalem to get the best of the best. Did Jesus pick the best of the best? He didn't even pick it from Jerusalem. You can make a case there was probably one guy who was close to Jerusalem. He was probably Judas, 
was the closest one to Jerusalem, but all the other ones were from Galilee, up north. Now, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It wasn't just a little saying. It was a true reality that they believed in. They spoke funny. You know, they spoke, they weren't highly sophisticated from Jerusalem. They were not the noble. They were not a royal class. But Jesus chose the very worst. The very worst him the best. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We read this on, on, on Sunday, so it just reminded me. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. God likes to choose not what the world would choose. Seems a little different, a little odd, doesn't it? Nebuchadnezzar picks the best, the noble, the handsome, the smart, the intellectuals. God chose fishermen and a tax collector that was hated. For consider your calling, brethren, verse 26, chapter 1, 1 Corinthians. Not so many wise according to the flesh, not so many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are. So that nobody may boast about what God has done, because totally, it's totally him. So not many great people in churches, not many uh, movers and shakers. It's really the people of God, and the world wants the best. And in verse 5, it says that they, they wanted to educate them. They wanted to bring them into the king's personal service. And look at verse 8. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice foods, with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission uh, from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. So they were brought into uh, this place so they should be educated and they would enter into uh, the king's personal service. They would be uh, appointed a ration of food. And verse 8, it tells us that they would not defile themselves. Daniel and his friends, ultimately, did not defile himself with the unclean foods. Now, this was God's standard. The Jews had standards of food, kosher laws. They would not to defile themselves with paganism. A lot of these foods were sacrificed to idols. And so they had strict laws against paganism and against the unkosher, unkosher foods. And Daniel and his friends did not defile themselves. So we would say Daniel and his friends were faithful to God. They were faithful to God. Despite being in a foreign land, despite being young, they did not defile themselves. Now, God cares about this more than the world. God cares about if you're faithful. Doesn't care if you're smart. Doesn't care if you're good looking. Thank God. Doesn't care if you're intellectual. Doesn't care any of that stuff. He cares if you're faithful. And out of all the people that they brought from Jerusalem, they were all Jews, only four of them decide not to go along with the program. That eye-opening, isn't it? All of them. Hey, they were supposed to follow God's law. They were there. They were brought in, foreign place. Hey, when in Rome, do like the Romans do. We're far from home. Well, we don't even know if God's promises are true anyway. He allowed this terrible thing to happen. We just should just live it up. Just be like everybody else. Why be different? But Daniel and his friends did not cave in. And so the world only care, the world doesn't care if you're faithful, by the way. The, the world only cares if you, if you can produce something for them. Right? That's the only thing. If, you're, if you are an intellectual, if you're strong, if you're smart, if you're good looking, if you're successful, that's what they care about. Whether you're faithful or not, they don't care. Don't ask, don't tell. But Jesus cares. Jesus cares about if you're faithful or not. And Daniel was willing to lose it all. It says he told them that he would, uh, that he would not eat of the food, that to, to, test them, to test the guard if he would eat the vegetables, that he would be a better appearance than those who were eating the food's choice, the king's food choice. And Daniel was prepared to lose his position, lose it all in order to be faithful to God. So uh, if you are not prepared to be faithful, then you're going to run into situations like that. And you have to make up your mind. It says Daniel made up his mind before it even happened that this was going to be the basic principles, right? The basic principles of God's kingdom is this, that you are willing to be the least. This is Christianity 101, right? 
Jesus said, if you want to be the greatest, be willing to be the least. Be the least. If you want to be the greatest, you'll be the least. If you want to be, if you want to be the greatest in God's kingdom, you've got to be the least here on earth. But if you don't want to be, you're going to be. <laughs> anyway, if you want to absorb greatness in this world, uh, like a little child, Jesus says, you have to earn, you have to uh, uh, enter in like a little child to enter into the kingdom. If you're not willing to be the least, you won't be the greatest. The least will be the greatest, and the greatest will be the least, Jesus said. So these are basic Christianity, basic principles. This is what uh, Daniel is employing here. So faithfulness. God has called us to be faithful, and that's the only condition that God calls us. We need faith to respond and to know, uh, to know the truth by faith. And so, But we need to grow. And this is the, uh, I don't think we're going to get, eh, not bad. We're, I don't think we're going to get too far into, we'll pick it up next time we study prophecy, is that God called us, right, a certain way. He didn't call us to be smart. He didn't call us to be intellectuals. He just called the weak things, the foolish things. But he doesn't want us to keep going that way. He doesn't want us to stay that way. He wants us to Grow. He wants us to grow. And in verse 17, it says, as, the, uh, as these four youth, God gave them knowledge and intelligence and in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. Then at the end of the days, which the king had specified for presenting, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. They can talk with them, and out of them, all of them, uh, all not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, so they enter the king's personal service. Remember, they had changed their name. Uh, verse 7, we didn't read it, but they changed their name. But the book of Daniel keeps their name uh, as the Hebrew name. And uh, don't have time, but if you look at all these names and how they were changed, it was literally losing their identity in the world. Uh, Belteshazzar, right? Baal, the servant of Baal. Um, what was it Mishael? Mishael became uh, Meshach. Mishael. Anybody know what Mishael means? It's kind of like Michael. It's almost, a, almost identical like Michael. Who is like? Who is like the Lord? Who is like the Lord? Uh, Meshach. Uh, the idea there is who is um, who's like their God. The God is Shach, right? The, the, they had a God there, and so they were, basically it's the reversal. Who is like the Lord? Well, now he's going to become Meshach. He's going to be the other God servant. So all these names representing a losing of identity. You were once a follower of Jesus or follower of God. Now you're going to be serving other gods. They try to change their name. Remember, Antichrist will try to make us do and be completely different than what God's called us to be. And so God gave them gifts. God gave them gifts, callings, right? So not only did God call them to himself, but also God empowered them. And he gave them gifts, and this is all, like if you read, when we read 1 Corinthians, we're going we're gonna, to um, delve into that on the gifts of God. Romans 12, 1 Peter, it's all about the gifts of God. How can we serve God? Now that he called us and saved us, there's only one way to serve God, his gifting and his calling. There's no other way of doing it. You need to be empowered by the Lord to serve him. That's the only way to serve God is his grace, his gift to you in order to serve him personally. That's the only way. Otherwise, we'll be serving him in the flesh, serving him in the flesh. And so I'm going to jump to chapter 2 because I'm just trying to wrap it up so we can get into our update. In chapter 2, the king has a dream. The king has a dream. So the gifts that God gives these men are essential, absolutely essential, necessary to serve God and to be useful in the kingdom of God. So same for us. Absolutely necessary. He calls us. We're nobodies. He calls us, but then God wants us to be his. And he empowers us by his spirit with gifts and callings that we may use it in his kingdom. Now, here's going to be the first test. Because right away, the king has a dream. Now, um, I'm tempted to read it all, but I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to read a few verses because we've got to get, we gotta get past this, uh, this part. It says, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was troubled. And he slept, and his sleep left him. And the king gave orders to all the magicians and sorcerers and the Chaldeans to tell the, uh, 
uh, to call in the magicians, the conjurers, sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the kings his dream. So they came in and stood before the king, and the king said to him, I had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. And the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever, tell us the dream. Uh, to your servants, and we will declare the interpretation. The king replied to the Chaldeans, The command for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn to limb, uh, limb from limb, and your houses will be made rubbish heap. Basically, you, your family, everything's going to be done. If, you're gonna, if you declare the dream and its interpretation, you'll receive from me gifts and reward and great honor. Therefore, declare to me the dream and its interpretation. And they answered a second time. And he said, let the king tell the dreams of servant, and will declare its interpretation. The king replied, I know certain that you are bargaining for time. Inasmuch as you have seen, the command from me is firm. If you did not make the dream known to me, there's only one decree for you, for you have agreed uh, together and speak lying and corrupt words before me until the situation has changed. Before, uh, therefore, tell me the dream, and I may know what you declared to me, its interpretation. So Nebuchadnezzar has a dream basically saying, um, I don't trust any of you guys, because uh, as soon as I tell you what the dream is, you're just going to come up and tell me some words, uh, corrupt words and lying words. I need you to tell me the dream and its interpretation. What does that tell you about Nebuchadnezzar? And the false religion that was around them. Did he really believe it? No. Not really, right? So here's one interesting fact. Uh, just like the spirit of Antichrist, right? Remember, comparing the two. Did, does the Antichrist really like religion? Ah, interesting. Does he really want religion? Does he really like false religions? Well, let me put something to you. Yeah, he is not interested in false religious systems. We know from the book of Revelation, what does he do with the, with the uh, harlot of Babylon? He burns her. Yeah, done with it. The only reason he put up with it was to use the harlot for to do what? Himself. Right? The Antichrist is only one religion. Himself. Man is God. Man is God. Nebuchadnezzar is not interested in religion. He could care less about the Chaldeans, the sorcerers, whatever. To him, they're all liars anyway. To him, Daniel and the, and the other three men were liars too because they're all part of this religious system. He only cares about one thing, himself. When this dream is interpreted, guess what happens? Uh, he builds a statue of gold of himself. Remember, the head was gold, but now he says, I'm going to be only Worship. I'm going to be the head of gold, right? Just like the Antichrist, he doesn't care about religion. He doesn't care, care less about it. He just wants to make a mockery of it. Because by making a mockery of it, he can what? Lifts himself up. Absolutely. Use it. Yeah, absolutely. Use it and lifts himself up to be ultimately worshipped. Because ultimately, what does Antichrist want to do? Second, Second Thessalonians 2 tells us he wants to enter into the temple of God and we worship as God. And it actually says, and we worship above also called God, right? Whatever religion, whatever people hold to in their religion as faith, God, uh, the Antichrist will want to replace it with the ultimate worship himself. God, uh, or I'm sorry, man wants to be worshiped, right? Ultimately is Satan, no doubt, but who's pushing the agendas, of course, uh, the Antichrist. So here is uh, Nebuchadnezzar pushing the agenda. Um, tell me, I don't think he, I, personally, I don't believe he realized that someone was going to come up with the interpretation. I think he wanted to get rid of them all. And he was, that's why he said, look, give me the dream interpretation. If you don't, everyone's going to die. Of course, we know later on in the same chapter, uh, Daniel says, hey, 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 don't be so hasty. Don't kill us. Uh, give us. Give us a time. Give us a night. We're going to pray. And we'll come back with it. And they came back, and God gave them exactly what the, uh, what the interpretation was. And he told them the dream and the interpretation. And therefore, he was able to, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was impressed, and he was able to exalt them. But it's quite interesting, because it says here, I'm going to jump to, uh, just to finish up, in chapter 2, um, in verse, uh, verse 27. 
Daniel answered before the king and said, as for the mystery, he's about to reveal the, inter- the dream and the interpretation, uh, which the king has inquired, neither wise men or conjurers or magicians nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. Daniel knows from God that all false religions, all Babylonians' false religions, and by the way, all false religions come from Babylon. All of them come from Babylon. They all have a root in Babylonianism, all right? And don't have time to go through it, but if you think of like, uh, think of the Antichrist will have a cheerleader, right? They all have a false prophet. Right? They all have a false prophet. So the Antichrist has a false prophet. In fact, it is the false prophet who causes the people to believe in, to, in, in the Antichrist. Right? Revelation 13 says the false prophet makes an image, and he's the one who causes people to believe in the Antichrist. He's got the biggest cheerleader of them all. The Antichrist is a figure. He's a man. But it's the false prophet who hypes it up and builds the image. And through great miracles, he's able to convince people, mesmerize them, that the Antichrist is the true, he is God, he is the one, he's the Messiah. Well, all false religious systems have that kind of form. They all have a, a prophet, so to speak, a false prophet. I mean, a, um, like a, a Messiah figure. And here comes a false prophet who cheers him on. Like, look at Mormonism, right? You have Joseph Smith. He is the, the, the founder of it, in a sense. But if you really dive into Mormonism, who's the real theologian of it? Anybody, no, no, no one's here was an ex-Mormon, right? But who's a real theologian there? Bring them young. You got it. Hey, you got it. So you got the figure, Joseph Smith. But who's the one that really, if you, you know, we went down to Utah, shared the gospel with them. Uh, you get down to the writings. It's Brigham Young who theologically sets up the structure of Mormonism and its theology and its current form. Even today, even in its current form. So everything has an antichrist. And it has a false prophet, one who brings about the worship of it, right? And it's no different than paganism. There's no different in other religions. But here is the spirit of Antichrist working through Nebuchadnezzar, applying these things. And he says, you know what? Ultimately, there's not going to be any God but me. Because in chapter 2 and chapter 3, everybody has to bow down to the image. And if you don't, it doesn't matter which God you, you worship, everybody has to bow down to the image. So that's at the real heart of Antichrist, is the destruction of religious system for that reason. Now, God also has his purposes, right? And God says, all religious system is false too. In that case, yeah, it is true. All religious system is false, except there's only one truth. Look at verse 28. However, king, there is a God in heaven who reveals mystery. And he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar that he will take place in the latter days that was in your dream, in your visions, in your mind, while you were in bed. However, king, I know you don't like much about religion, but there's one truth. The God of heaven. You might want to get rid of everything. In fact, Antichrist will try to get rid of everything. uh, And he'll use it for his own purposes. But God is going to use it for his own purpose. Because ultimately, there's going to be one person to be worshipped. That's Christ Jesus, right? And while the Antichrist will try to get rid of all religious systems to exalt himself above every so-called God, God will be working through Daniel, Hananiah, Meshach, right? Azariah, and lifting the name of God, lifting the Messiah in the presence of Nebuchadnezzar. Well, same thing for us. While the spirit of Antichrist is working through cults and religious systems, he's not interested in that. Honestly, it's all a mockery. It's really all it is because at the end of the day, the average person is going to want one thing, to be their own God. And that's the appeal. You see how many people don't like religion today? I don't blame them. I don't blame them. The crazy cults and all this stuff and false teachers. and I don't. Bl- <laughs> the average person has all the right to believe, but... Ultimately, they have to believe in Christ. They have to trust in Jesus. The average person wants to get rid of everything so he doesn't have to answer to anybody but himself. And ultimately, it's the the will of Satan. It's the will of Satan for man to be like God. What was the first temptation in the garden? The first lie in the garden? When you eat of this, you will be like 
God, back to the same thing. We're back to Genesis. We haven't left elementary school class much, right? It's still the same thing. What you learn in elementary, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so. Still the same, still applicable, but it's just a, a deeper meaning to it because ultimately it's all about God's people. It may not be Azariah and Daniel and, Mish- and uh, uh, Mishael here, uh, but there's Keith and Dana and Frank and Anthony, right? Those are... The Daniels, the Mishael, the, 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 the Azariahs, they're the ones who are going to have to tell the truth. Amen. They're the ones who have to come before the system of the world that wants to say, forget all religions, man's the only one that counts, and so lift man up. No, we say there's a God of heaven who reveals mystery. There's one Messiah, there's one mediator between man and God, and that is Christ Jesus. And that's, the, that's what the gifting is for, and we'll get into it next time. Because uh, I gotta, I gotta hurry. But that's what the gifting and the calling is for, so that we will be able to tell the truth about God in a difficult place. Because they were in Babylon. Sometimes I feel like I'm in Babylon. Sometimes I feel like I'm in a foreign place. Sometimes I feel like I'm a Martian, uh, just because of how how rapidly things have changed in the world and where it's headed. And yet there's a God of heaven who reveals mysteries. There's a God who has shown us His Word and His truth, and we have it. But who's going to be the one who proclaims it? They're going to be great temptation to bow down, to cave in, to eat the unclean food sacrifice to idols, to participate in idolatry and immorality and paganism. But ultimately, it's faithfulness. Because that's what God is after. So if you're faithful, God will use you. God is not interested in how smart you are. None of us would qualify if it was a, it was a, it was a competition of smartness, right? Right? Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. If we were that intellectual, that brilliant of mind, not many noble, not many wise according to this world. But God is pleased to use the foolish and simple things of this world to confound the wise. Now, the amazing thing about Daniel, Daniel was a noble. And Daniel had wisdom. And God used him, right? God incredibly used him. But it wasn't about the gift, was it? It was about God's calling on his life, right? No, no amount of intellect, no amount of knowledge, no amount of anything would have served Daniel any good had not God revealed the dream about Nebuchadnezzar. He would have been gone with all the other satraps and Chaldeans and sorcerers and magicians. But there's a God of heaven who revealed that. And that same thing for us. We're no different than anybody else in this world. I'm the same person, the same sin, the same struggles, the same difficulties, the same hardships. And then you become a Christian and you realize it's even more. (laughs) Because now there's a spiritual world that we have to deal with. And there's things against us. And the only difference is there's a God of heaven who called you and gifted you and empowered you to tell the truth. And that is our calling. And that is our mission, just like the boys, I call them youth, men, uh, in the book of Daniel.